if you want to uh, take your seat. Nous allons commencer la dernière, le dernier panel juste avant euh, le forum euh, de la prochaine génération. Donc, euh, le dernier, ce dernier panel, en fait, porte sur euh, commençons à planifier l'avenir. Euh, la science va s'intéresser aux solutions possibles, euh, aux outils et aux taxes alternatives qui peuvent aider à maintenir l'efficacité des systèmes d'imposition dans le contexte de la concurrence fiscale. Donc, toute idée qui peuvent euh, aider à, à préserver l'efficacité des régimes d'imposition pour l'avenir. Euh, on a un panel chargé d'excellents experts. Laissez-moi vous présenter. Je vais tous les, les présenter, puis par la suite, ils parleront euh, un à la suite de l'autre. La première panéliste, euh, Alexandra Redhead, Alexandra is an independent advisor on international taxation and the extractive industries. Her work is focused on I issues of tax avoidance by multinational extractive companies in developing countries. She has authored and co-authored a range of policy reports and guidelines, including the first reference book for tax practitioners on transfer pricing in mining. Second speaker, Edwin Weiser, He is a tax partner at PricewaterhouseCoopers, PwC, the Netherlands, a tax policy leader for the Europe, Middle East, and Africa region, member of the Global Tax Policy Core Team, leader of PwC's Tax Controversy and Dispute Resolution Network for the EMEA region. His practice includes, among other things, representing PwC in tax policy matters, boardroom consulting, and strategic tax advice. Le prochain conférencier sera Mohamed Djouldem. Mohamed est maître de conférence en sciences politiques à l'Université Paul Valéry à Montpellier et chercheur à l'UMR 5281. Il a co-publié « Lutter contre le non-recours, un révélateur du renouvellement des politiques publiques ». Ses recherches actuelles portent sur l'internalisation pardon, l'internationalisation des finances publiques, les politiques de lutte contre la pauvreté et les politiques de l'environnement. Next speaker, Paul Martin. He was appointed tax director of the Office of Tax Simplification in March 2017. Prior to that, he was tax director for RELX Group, formerly Reed Elsevier the Global Information Analytics, group, Analytics Groups for 12 years. He was actively engaged with the OECD and tax policy makers on matters relating to the digital economy and many other aspects of tax policy. Le dernier conférencier de ce panel, Stéphane Palage, il est doyen de l'École des sciences de la gestion de l'Université du Québec à Montréal et professeur au département des sciences économiques de cette école. Originaire de Belgique et citoyen canadien, il détient un PhD en économie de la Tepper School of Business de l'Université Carnegie Mellon. We will start the panel with uh, Alexandra Redhead. Thank you very much, and thanks to Tax Corp for having me here this afternoon. My name is Alexandra, and today I'm going to share with you some work uh, being done by the Intergovernmental Forum on Mining in collaboration with the OECD on how to address tax base erosion and profit shifting in the mining sector in developing countries. Um, why am I talking about uh, mining? Well, for many developing countries, uh, they rely to a great extent on the revenues or potential revenues from the mining sector as well as from oil and gas. Uh, so it's a, of incredible importance to many developing countries that they collect uh, a fair share, a reasonable return, the taxes that they're owed on their natural resources. So together with the OECD, the Intergovernmental Forum on Mining, saw fit uh, to help tax authorities in developing countries to try and counter BEPs in the mining sector specifically. 
So just very briefly to show you, uh, the Intergovernmental Forum on Mining is the global body representing governments of mining countries. It has roughly 60 members uh, and there's a spread, as you can see, between developing countries as well as uh, members such as the UK, Russia, Canada, South Africa and so forth. So there's a mix of countries that are involved and they're actually all here uh, downstairs, upstairs, I can't remember which, this week discussing uh, the mining issues in their countries. So this is the, the uh, countries that the Intergovernmental Forum on Mining represents. And uh, in 2015, these member countries came together and they said that their most pressing concern was base erosion and profit shifting in the mining sector, that they needed help tackling this. As a result, the IGF came together with the OECD to set up the BEPS in Mining program, which covers 10 different topics, 10 different causes of tax avoidance in the mining sector. So you can see that of these 10 issues, some of them are reflected in the OECD BEPS project but not all of them because there are other causes of tax avoidance that are specific to mining. So for example, uh, things like uh, hedging arrangements uh, in mining as well as oil and gas, metal streaming. I won't go into the technicalities of these tax planning strategies, but they are certainly not reflected in the OECD program. Hence, we, are, we have a unique program looking at BEPS issues in mining. So our aim is to provide policy and administrative tools to address each of these 10 issues. And if I can share with you a little bit of the work that we've begun on tax competition, the use of tax incentives to attract mining investment, which I think is the theme for today, uh, the findings that we have uh, based on research we've undertaken into the use of incentives in the mining sector and the tools that we are now developing to help uh, countries try and curtail the harmful effects of tax competition and tax incentives. So as you can see on the screen behind me, based on some research that we've done looking at publicly available mining contracts as well as legislation, one of the challenges in mining is that you have tax incentives at many levels. So you may have uh, preferential tax treatment of mining in the general tax code. So for example, the uh, corporate tax rate for, for, for everyone is 30%, but then a preferential rate of 25% might be given to the mining sector. Then you have another level in the mining legislation itself, where it may have a separate mining fiscal regime built into that mining legislation which again grants a raft of incentives specific to the sector and then you have a third level which is incentives provided at the contract level so for those of you that are less familiar with the mining sector uh, it's very common for companies to request individual con contracts with the government that set out the precise fiscal terms that will apply to their mining project so again you see incentives at that level not to mention the interaction with double tax agreements where we see mining companies uh, making use of uh, favourable tax terms in DTAs and hence restructuring their investments uh, into the mining sector in developing countries. So you can see, based on these countries that we looked at, there's quite a range of tax incentives provided at the level of the primary legislation as well as at the contract level, which makes developing tools uh, to tackle the use of incentives challenging because you have to be looking at the interaction between incentives uh, at different levels. It's interesting to see that some countries, for example, Zambia, Guinea, Sierra Leone, um, not only do they have a, a large number of tax incentives, but they uh, grant a number of those incentives in the mining contract themselves, which creates concerns with respect to governance and transparency. The next point uh, that we found in our research is that, surprisingly, tax incentives are still very, very common in mining. And it's surprising because uh, people would suggest that mining is very location specific. Uh, unlike Starbucks or Amazon or Google that can relocate their IP around the world, uh, mines are where the assets are. So, so in that regard, you would expect tax incentives to be uh, less uh, impactful or influential on investors' decisions. But what we find based on contract analysis of contracts, as well as the legislation, is that incentives abound uh, in the sector and in of particular concern 
uh, the number of incentives that we see in relation to corporate tax, particularly the use of tax holidays, uh, are still very common in mining, uh, as well as uh, incentives around withholding tax and stabilisation, which again in mining is where investors will require that the fiscal terms are stabilised, which means that they might not be able to change or reflect um, improvements in the law. So these are of concern to us because we see them as areas that are, are liable to tax abuse by investors, uh, and I'll say a bit more about that. So in our research, what we are trying to emphasise to the governments that we work with is that whenever you're thinking about incentives, you need to think about the static fiscal effect, so what is the direct cost of foregoing tax revenue, and what are the BEPS effects, the ways in which companies might exploit or abuse these tax incentives to maximise the benefits beyond that which the government intended. So thinking about at two levels here is with respect to how we cost incentives. And this is important because a lot of governments really think at the first level of, well, if I give uh, withholding tax relief, I'm going to lose X amount in withholding tax, not anticipating that companies may then uh, misuse or abuse that incentive, which then increases the cost in terms of tax, tax revenue foregone. So one example of this um, in the mining sector is here you have uh, within country B, you have a mine and a processing facility. And that processing facility sits in an economic processing zone, which is tax free. So they don't pay tax on, on the profits that they generate. Now, the direct revenue loss uh, that the government is looking at is what is the revenue we're foregoing in granting tax-free status to the processing facility in the economic processing zone. However, what they may not anticipate is where that mine is selling its product to the processing facility because they are related parties, they may choose to undervalue or underprice that sale so as to reduce its taxable income, which is subject to a different tax rate in the same country. So this is where tax incentives, even within the same jurisdiction, can lead to uh, abuse and misuse and, in effect, uh, base erosion and profit shifting. So this is the types of behavioural responses that we are trying to address in our guidance. So in terms of the tools that we are developing, the first one is uh, a risk assessment framework for uh, the BEPS effect of tax incentives. So helping to um, raise awareness amongst policymakers and decision makers of what are the potential BEPS effects or the ways that particular tax incentives might be misused. And you can see on the screen we rank them from high to low risk. And it's important for decision makers to bear this in mind when they're thinking about the suite of tax incentives that are available to them as to how do we avoid the types of incentives that are going to produce tax abuse, that are going to increase the likelihood of BEPS taking place. So we are starting from a point of Tax incentives are, uh, to some extent, a reality for many developing countries, and they feel that it's necessary to offer them. But let's be a little bit smarter and more strategic about the types of incentives that we offer, uh, what the objectives are, what these incentives achieve, and what the risks are. The second tool that we are providing in addition to this risk framework is a financial modelling tool. So. One thing we've talked already today about the importance of governments having an having a accurate idea of the cost of the tax incentive before they give it away. So we are helping uh, governments of mining countries to apply financial modelling to determine the cost of incentives and the cost with respect to the static effect. So you can see on the screen here you have the baseline and the static effect, which is the loss in revenue, the revenue foregone as a result of ground granting a 10-year tax holiday, but then in addition, we have the BEPS effect, which is how, what additional revenue might we lose as a result of companies exploiting this incentive or using it in ways that it wasn't intended. So for example, in mining, you might see a mining company speed up production 
the rate of extraction or extract the higher quality ore during the period of the tax holiday so as to minimise the taxes that they pay after the tax holiday finishes. So this is a financial modelling tool that helps uh, governments to cost fiscal incentives both with respect to uh, the static effect and the BEPS effect, which we think is important. It's difficult because it requires making informed assumptions about the base erosion and profit shifting practices that companies might employ, but at least it gives governments some idea as to which incentives have a higher level of risk attached versus others uh, and which incentives are going to be more strategic uh, for, for governments to employ. So the last slide is just to say, as I mentioned, the Intergovernmental Forum on Mining is meeting this week here at the UN in Geneva. Uh, it's their annual general meeting. And on Friday, we have a day that is dedicated to BEPS in mining, where we will be discussing in greater detail the work that we are doing on tax incentives, as well as other causes of base erosion and profit shifting in the mining sector. Uh, it is an open event. Uh, you're still able to register and to join us on Friday if you have uh, an interest in helping developing countries to combat BEPs in the mining sector. Thank you. Alexandra, we will now turn it uh, over to uh, Edwin Weiser. Okay, good afternoon. Um, thank you for having me here. Um, and good to see so many uh, young people in the audience. I hope that tax is still indeed a study that attracts young people. I couldn't convince my own son, but good that you're here. I'll say a few words on uh, the importance of multilateral cooperation and, in my view, the need for more principle-based minimum and multilateral standards. At this moment, Pascal said it already, the taxation of the digital economy is at the heart of a quite a heated debate in the EU and the OECD. And also the UN will play its role, I think. And the question is whether digitalization will have a disruptive influence on the current standards uh, in international taxation, and will it also have a disruptive effect on multilateral cooperation? To start, I'll say a few words on multilateral cooperation, then I'll reflect on the question whether digitalization could indeed be a disruptive force. And before we can talk about solutions, we have some fundamental issues to be to address briefly, of course. And if you want to have multilateral minimum standards that can cope with every with an ever-changing world and ever-changing business models, we may want to elevate those minimum standards to a more principled level. I will close with a few recommendations. Every major crisis in the past has led to more cooperation um, between countries, more multilateralism. An example is the League of Nations after the World War I. After World War II, the OCD, the IMF, the World Bank were established. And I think multilateral cooperation brings a lot of good also in the tax area. It provides level playing fields, uh, uh, international standards that will ensure a stable international environment and lead to more prosperity at the end of the day. In 2008, we had the financial crisis sparked by the demise of Lehman Brothers. And at that time, shortly after that, uh, was then that the Ministry of Finance, political leaders declared that the era of bank secrecy was, was over. And indeed, it happened by cooperation between the OECD, countries in the Global Forum for Exchange of Information and Transparency, more than 100 countries, and also uh, the G20. The financial crisis also led to a public outcry on tax planning and tax behaviour, fair share paid by multinationals. Hearings in parliaments, for example, in the UK, uh, the LuxLeaks scandal, the Panama Papers, they all led to a sort of revamp of multilateral cooperation, leading to new transparency standards and also to the BEPS package to which Pascal already alluded to. The fact, I think, that countries could agree to a multilateral treaty, the multilateral instrument, to implement the minimum standards in more than 3,000 tax treaties between countries, I think is a showcase on how powerful multilateral cooperation can be. And for business also it's very important because it provides for a level playing field for a single standard. And that is, I think, what's important for, for business. We see the same in the EU with the anti-avoidance 
text directives one and two. Very powerful that they could indeed agree on uh, a directive for uh, direct taxation because normally indirect taxation is the only competence of the European Union. Um, the question now is whether digitization will disrupt and threaten this. We talked about e-commerce and doing business electronically in the past a lot of times. It was subject to various studies of the OECD in the late 90s and in conferences at Turku and Ottawa some principles were defined. And I can be very brief about the outcome back then. The conclusion was the international tax rules are still fit for purpose. And what has changed? Well, in 2007, traditional companies like ExxonMobil accounted for the top five of the largest companies in the world. Right now, the top five consists solely of digital powerhouses like Apple, Alphabet, Google, Microsoft, Amazon, and Facebook. The digital economy already presents, represents sorry, 22.5% of the world economy, and artificial intelligence will help to expand the worldwide economy by approximately 14%. Business models and value chains are changing fundamentally, and value creation is becoming increasingly independent of physical activities and physical presence in the market. Naturally, even 30 years ago, it was possible for a French wine grower to send boxes of wine to the Dutch market, to Dutch customers, without being physically present in the Netherlands. This type of trade is not normally classed as a permanent establishment. The great speed with which information and communication technology is developing means that the same French wine grower can upscale his activities in the Dutch market without being physically present in the Netherlands. And it may even allow him to engage more easily with customers rather than through intermediaries. However, all marketing, sales, distribution and after-sales activities could still take place in France. In that sense, the location of where the value has been created has not changed. And digitalization has merely opened new markets and reduced barriers to growth. It's hard to understand why the French wine growers' digital access to the Dutch market, to the Dutch customer, should be considered to yield a different, to yield a different tax result than the result with the customer access of decades past. I think it's also worth reiterating that Action 1 of the final BEPS report of October 2015 concluded that the perceived problem to be addressed is the digitalization of business of all types and sectors rather than some ID of a digital economy that can be clearly identified and taxed separately, as currently seems to be the ID. This issue at hand needs a longer time, longer term global solution, while stressing the need to avoid unilateral and reflex actions like GAFA initiative and GAFA Texas. Policymakers, in my view, can and should focus on digitalization as an overall accelerator to growth, with taxation as a potential and significant restraint if it is not done appropriately. Withholding taxes and equalization levies are a very bad idea. They lead to double taxation and multiple taxation. The same goes for constructions like digital PEs or treating robots as corporations, because we don't have a clue which profit we can allocate and should allocate to such a digital P or a robot. We need a more profound and better understanding, I think, of the value created in new uh, business models. Corporate taxation in its current form has more or less been formed nearly a century ago. And like an all company taxes to tax base, it has been said before, is determined by profits. Profits originate from the various activities performed by companies and must be allocated to the countries where these activities take place. And for many years, the place of residence and permanent establishment have formed the legal and the physical benchmark for evaluating company activities when levying corporate income tax based on the ter territoriality principle. But the multinationals at these days, for instance, production, distribution, marketing, research and development, financing and head office activities all take place at diverse and different locations. Global profits of multinational companies are determined by many activities by many legal entities in many countries. I have to speed up, I see. Two minutes left. Allocating profits has become an extremely complicated undertaking. Transfer pricing rules are increasing exponentially in number and complexity. 
and have resulted in high compliance and enforcement costs and increased risk of double taxation. The digital transformation is fundamentally altering value chains within multinational companies and is making it almost impossible to answer questions about who does what, where and for how much profit. I'll skip the part on the fundamental uh, uh, argumentation why we should have a corporate income tax. Um, but a few words. Tax on company profits has to be said. It also has been demonstrated in an OCD study, tax and economic growth, that is one of the most disruptive taxations we can have. Uh, alternative forms of corporate income tax have been considered, mainly only in academic studies, but have not been part of an international debate. And each alternative is designed to target the yield from different contributions. For example, total capital or economic rent. The actual impact of fundamental changes to this current system would be substantial. Once the BEPS measures have been implemented, countries will, more than now, start competing with their rates of corporation tax, creating a form of tax competition not only answered by BEPS, not answered by BEPS. Even in the post-BEPS era, tax will continue to have a negative impact on investment and location-based decisions. Establishing service activities in countries with a low rate of taxation will be the new form of tax planning. I predict that not before too long, this will again spark a heated political and public debate. Unilateral action by individual countries or groups of countries are undesirable, disruptive and will inhibit certainty and economic growth, not in the least because of the double or multiple taxation as a consequence. Unilateral actions also undermine trust between countries in the international tax system. Even if or maybe when we succeed in multilaterally agreeing on supplementary or new set of rules to address the issues at hand, it's quite likely that new business and geopolitical developments will spark similar reactions and discussions in the future. We can better address those if we were able to agree upon a set of guiding tax policy principles that would apply to the taxation of corporates. For example, neutrality. We all want neutral taxation and neutral corporate income taxes, but it's also the elephant in the room because when addressing that we shy away from fundamental discussions on questions whether to tax economic rent or only or using, for example, the destination uh, principle. We can think of a set of principle, principles which we can elevate to a multilateral minimum standard that countries should adhere to when they tax corporates. This would reduce tax competition and the negative impact, impact of tax on economic decisions. We need to start an international tax policy debate to think deep and hard on the current international tax system and to what extent the current system of source and residence meet the guiding tax policy principles as formulated before. The thinking should also include studying and analyzing alternatives with an open mind, also with regard to firmly vested principles. We should allow ourselves two to three years to come up with the answers. In this period of time, we can also better evaluate how the BEPS measures enable countries to tax value created in their countries by digital businesses. In this process, we need to discuss and agree on, tax, on guiding tax policy principles. This is the only way, in my view, to move away from entrenched positions and to find real solutions instead of tinkering around the edges. Those guiding tax policy principles ideally would form a new minimum standard that can cope with an ever-changing world and ever-changing business models and that countries have to adhere to and that is also subject to a peer review mechanism. Thank you. Thank you very much. I could not agree more with the, uh, the fact that we should tackle the issues with an open mind. I think that's what we are doing the, the entire day, so, so listening to different uh, perspectives on, on, on taxation. Nous allons maintenant céder la parole à Mohamed Juldem pour uh, la prochaine présentation. Je vais essayer de partir d'un certain nombre de constats qui ont été établis ce matin et cet après-midi. Il y a au moins quatre constats sur lesquels, je pense, nous sommes tous d'accord 
et qui a été, le premier a été évoqué par Annette Alsteider. Derrière l'évasion fiscale se cachent les riches. Et euh, cette évasion fiscale n'a cessé d'augmenter malgré les révélations, les dernières, à propos des Panama Papers. La seconde constat que nous partageons également, c'est que la transparence est la marque de sociétés civilisées, ce qui veut dire, à contrario, que euh, là où euh, il, y a, il y a beaucoup d'évasion fiscale, nous pouvons observer des processus de décivilisation. Le troisième constat a été de dire pour certains le regretter et pour d'autres l'approuver. Il n'existe pas d'autorité fiscale supranationale. Enfin, le dernier, les activités et les enjeux économiques se sont globalisés. À l'inverse, les souverainetés fiscales des États restent nationales. Donc là, il y a une certaine inadéquation euh, entre le pouvoir d'imposer et euh, le, la dimension ou l'échelle où euh, s'exercent les activités économiques. Ce constat amène à se poser un certain nombre de questions avant d'envisager de quelle manière il faut faire des suggestions ou tenter de planifier l'avenir. Première question qu'on peut se poser est que faut-il faire pour réguler efficacement le capitalisme financier globalisé alors, par efficacité, il s'agit bien entendu ici de parler d'efficacité économique, mais pas seulement. Il s'agit aussi de se poser la question de l'efficacité juridique, de l'efficacité politique, notamment dans sa dimension démocratique, mais aussi un point essentiel, l'efficacité en termes d'éthique. Il peut y avoir une efficacité économique et juridique, mais avec une absence, une négligence, voire même un évitement de l'éthique. Deuxième question qu'on peut se poser, quels instruments faut-il construire et mettre en œuvre pour faire face à l'aggravation de l'érosion fiscale, de l'érosion, pardon, de la souveraineté fiscale Et notamment, comment faire de sorte pour réduire la concentration mondiale des richesses Enfin, suffit-il, comme cela a été fait jusqu'à présent, suffit-il de repenser le modèle fiscal en mettant en place l'échange automatique d'informations. Eh bien, pour répondre à ces questions, je dirais que les avancées réalisées jusqu'à présent, ces dernières années, sont importantes, sans doute. Mais elles méritent d'être poursuivies, complétées, renforcées par des mécanismes et des règles robustes. Il faut non seulement s'assurer que les entreprises, les riches, les États, et notamment les États à paradis fiscaux, coopèrent, mais surtout qu'ils fournissent des informations complètes, fiables et incontestables, ce qui n'est pas toujours le cas, parce qu'on sait que les, ces États ont une capacité d'inventivité pour se construire des mécanismes de contournement, voire de silence et de ne pas transmettre les informations indispensables. Il ne fait pas de doute pour un certain nombre de chercheurs, et je m'y inclus dedans, l'impératif de contrôle du capitalisme financier globalisé nécessite d'inventer de nouveaux outils. Et parmi ces outils, un qui nous paraît absolument indispensable, c'est la constitution d'un cadastre financier mondial comme il existe au sein de chaque État un cadastre qui permet de suivre la richesse foncière et la richesse immobilière et qui permet aux États de taxer exactement la valeur de ces biens immobiliers ou des biens mobiliers. L'intérêt d'un cadastre est de permettre aux administrations fiscales de vérifier empiriquement, je dis bien empiriquement, que les banques, les entreprises et les détenteurs de, fo de, de fortune transmettent effectivement les données dont elles disposent. Et ce cadastre permet de s'assurer que les contribuables, dont je viens de faire état, 
remplissent bien leurs obligations déclaratives. Il permet également d'exercer une réelle surveillance et de savoir qui possède de quoi et qui doit combien au trésor public. Comment faire alors Eh bien, ce cadastre aura vocation à enregistrer tous les titres et en particulier tous les actifs financiers, actions, obligations, etc. Mais surtout d'authentifier les propriétaires. Il ne suffit pas, comme cela a été dit ce matin, que derrière l'évasion fiscale, il y a des riches. Certes, c'est une avancée, mais qui sont ces riches Quel est leur nom, leur prénom, etc. etc. Sont-elles des institutions, des personnes physiques Et si on n'a pas ces données, il serait très difficile aux administrations fiscales d'exercer leur pouvoir d'extraction de ressources. Alors, comment ce cadastre sera alimenté et comment il peut obtenir ces informations Une des idées c'est de dire que ce cadastre sera alimenté par les dépositeurs centraux de titres, là où ces titres sont enregistrés. Et il existe dans tous les pays, évidemment, ces centres où sont déposés les titres. Il y a également, bien entendu, les titres qui sont apatrides. De certains euh, ne registrent pas leurs titres dans leur propre pays, ni dans leur propre monnaie, mais ailleurs, dans la zone euro ou ailleurs. Eh bien, ces titres apatrides peuvent également être identifiés en sollicitant, par exemple, euh, des euh, dépositaires comme Euroclear ou Clerstram au Luxembourg. Et ces institutions combleront ce vide. Alors reste une dernière question. Quel statut donné au cadastre financier international Est-ce qu'il faut le rattacher à une organisation internationale qui dispose de ressources d'expertise et de ressources euh, juridiques comme l'OCDE et donc le rattacher par exemple à la euh, direction de l'administration et des politiques fiscales dont a fait état euh, ce matin euh, euh, sainte omen ou bien euh, faut-il aller au-delà et plaider pour un statut spécifique qui confère au, ca au cadastre un réel pouvoir d'action, notamment avec une obligation d'informer qui sera imposée à euh, des acteurs dont je viens de faire état, euh, les euh, entreprises, les banques, et euh, les euh, détenteurs de euh, richesses. Donc, un autre élément qui peut intervenir et qui a été déjà suggéré par euh, Thomas Piketty, c'est euh, l'impôt euh, sur le capital à un niveau international, avec un taux ou un barème autour de 2%. Eh bien, cet organisme, euh, s'il est constitué indépendamment d'une organisation internationale, ou en tant qu'organisation internationale, à l'image de l'Agence internationale de l'énergie, on peut bien imaginer l'Agence mondiale de la fiscalité. Et cette agence serait tout à fait autonome pour pouvoir effectivement prélever ce taux de 2% sur euh, les titres euh, et les actifs. Et les États pourront, par le biais de leur administration, constater si les informations dont elles disposent sont effectivement des informations qui sont conformes à ce que les contribuables ont déclaré. Et ensuite, si les États veulent exercer, si les États exercent leur souveraineté fiscale, s'ils veulent un impôt zéro, elles peuvent restituer ce qui a été prélevé à, aux contribuables. A l'inverse, si les États veulent imposer, ils auront évidemment la possibilité de récupérer ce qui a été prélevé par cette agence internationale. Voilà en gros l'idée sous-jacente à cette proposition de cadastre financier mondial. Je vous remercie. Merci, merci beaucoup euh, Mohamed. Euh, 
Uh, it is now turn for the turn of uh, Paul Morton. Thank you very much. In uh, 1963, somebody called Leo Mattersdorf wrote a letter to the Times magazine about his good friend Albert Einstein, and he said that Al Einstein said the hardest thing in the world to understand is the income tax. And that was in 1963. So I'd suggest that now in 2017, uh, taxes have simply become too complicated. They're too complicated for individuals to understand their own tax affairs, how many people in the more complex countries can complete their own tax return. They're too complicated for ordinary people to understand how large business is being taxed. And they're too complicated for large business, which bears a disproportionate administration cost, uncertainty, and some, um, some obstacles in the way of cross-border trade and investment uh, because of unclear tax outcomes. Uh, as we see, for example, in, in Europe with uh, new concepts of transfer pricing um, appearing in recent years. Uh, arguably, in international tax, we've really reached a tipping point where multinational corporations uh, with the greatest amount of resources and expertise are going to be unable to be certain as to their future tax position. And I think this is brought into even sharper light by developments in the digital economy. I could share a few personal observations about the digital economy. Um, firstly, I think it is impossible to value data. It is impossible to correctly value the use of data. Uh, people talk about taxing data where it's used or digital services where they're enjoyed. Extremely difficult to value. It's extremely difficult to value the cost of data or to allocate the cost of an enterprise between different uh, kinds of data and different provision of digital services. So the digital economy presents fundamental problems to the tax system uh, we've developed so far. And there must be a risk of some breakdown in the international consensus in the taxation of um, business profits uh, in addressing these very difficult problems. So what can we do about this, uh, this fact that the tax system has become excessively complicated? Well, one approach um, is the approach we take in the UK with our Office of Tax Simplification. This was set up in 2010 um, and put on the statute book as a formally um, uh, underpinned organisation within the Treasury, that's the UK uh, Ministry for Finance and Economics, um, and an independent office in that although it sits within the Treasury, it can express its own opinions based on the research that it undertakes. The staffing of the Office of Tax Simplification is also unusual for a, a government body effectively in that it represents a mixture of people from uh, with Treasury experience, uh, with tax administration experience, and from the private sector, from large corporates, small corporates, and from professional firms, and therefore represents a wide mix of perspective, experience, and interests. And the focus of the office is purely on simplification. As far as we know, we are the only body anywhere in the world focused exclusively on tax simplification. So we've asked ourselves, what are the causes of tax complexity? Why is it that we have such a complex tax system? Uh, well, unquestionably, this is in part because the business world is complex, society is complex, and the tax system has to reflect that. But it's also a, a factor of the amount of change we see in the tax world. Why is it difficult to become, perhaps more difficult, to become a tax lawyer than a lawyer specialising in other areas? It's because tax law changes at a ferocious pace, and that change produces constant increases in complexity. Clearly, tax avoidance contributes to complexity. Uh, so a, fun, a, a basic um, policy idea is encapsulated in law. Clever people find a way to avoid that principle. Um, then we produce anti-avoidance legislation. Clever people find a way to avoid the anti-avoidance legislation, and we find that we have more anti-avoidance legislation. Thirdly, 
we're all driven to achieve a result in tax which reflects fairness. I ask sometimes, would you rather have a tax system which was simple but not so fair, or more complex but fairer? I think most of us intuitively feel that a fair system sounds better, even if it's more complex, although I would ask in the end whether the complexity creates something which is inherently unfair. And finally, tax systems in every country reflect non-tax policy objectives, encouragement of certain behaviour or investment, discouragement of certain behaviour or investment, and that too complicates the tax system. So what can we do to point ourselves in the direction of a simpler tax system? First of all, we can put tax simplification at the heart of tax policy making. So when a policy objective is being developed or being incorporated into a tax system, we should think about simplification. Is there a simpler route to achieve the same objective? We should think creatively about alternatives. Perhaps an alternative to one kind of complex anti-avoidance rule maybe is a simpler approach to the underlying policy principle. We think that we should look at the life cycle of a business. We should ask at certain key points in that life cycle, such as the first expansion abroad or the first occasion on which we seek outside capital in a business, what is the impact of all the taxes on the business owner and how does the complexity in the interaction of those taxes impact on business behaviour? And the same with individuals. At key points um, in the lives of individuals, how do all the taxes impact on the decisions they make. We should try to avoid thresholds, cut-offs, multiple rates, uh, exceptions, so many of these uh, familiar features of tax systems which create behavioural issues or create distortions. And we should focus quite relentlessly on the user experience. How does it feel for an individual or the owner of a business to interact with that tax system? both administratively and in the decisions they're making about their, their earnings or their business. Um, we also think that technology will provide answers to some of these questions. Technology will provide ways in which people can be provided with clearer and more complete information about their tax affairs. Uh, so, for example, for many individuals in the most developed countries, all the information required for their tax return is collected automatically and presented to them. In at least one country, we've heard that many people have so much trust in the system that they don't even take the time to press one button on their smartphone to confirm that they agree with that information. Now, how do we feel about that when the automation of tax administration has gone so far that people check out of the tax system altogether? Should we be worried about that? Or should we be pleased that we've achieved the ultimate in simplification for those individuals? Well, uh, I'll conclude by simply saying that this seems a good time to refocus our energy on simplification at the domestic level, the individual level, small businesses, large businesses, and most certainly at the international level. Thank you. Thank you very much. De, le dernier conférencier pour uh, le panel, Stéphane Palage. Thank you very much. I, I love the idea of a simpler tax code. Uh, in fact, it doesn't have to be unfair. Uh, it, could, it could still be very fair. Um, this is a session about the future. Uh, future of tax competition or the future of tax cooperation. Uh, there may be many possible futures. Uh, some are good, some are not so good, uh, and achieving the good ones are typically difficult, and uh, they, it, requires a, it requires a commitment by many people, uh, many governments. So my name is Stéphane Palage, I'm a dean, dean of a business school in Montreal called ESG, very large business school in the University of Quebec in Montreal. Uh, but I'm also an economist, and it is in this quality that I will be speaking today. Uh, as an economic researcher, I have long worked on games, games that human beings play with one another. 
We all know the difficulty, for example, of sharing an apartment with a roommate. While it clearly reduces the cost of the rent, it poses a series of challenges. Who will clean the dishes? Who will wipe the floor? Simple questions, but with non-negligible consequences. We can view these situations as games, with strategies and outcomes that economists tend to call equilibria. In the sharing of a common apartment, the equilibrium is often socially very bad. None of the roommates want to clean the dishes because if they do, the other will not. Hence, after a few trials and errors, the roommates tend to converge to a situation in which towers of dirty dishes build up on the kitchen counter. This game is actually a very simple version of a game called The Prisoner's Dilemma, used by mathematician Albert Tucker and some colleagues in 1950 to illustrate the use of a discovery made at the MIT that, that same year by uh, a mathematician called John Nash, which was later called, in fact, the Nash Equilibrium a solution to the game that simple rationality principles will predict. In fact, you may know John Nash uh, for many reasons. He actually won a Nobel Prize in economics in 1994. He was also the subject of a very famous movie called e, um, uh, A Beautiful Mind, which uh, earned a few, a few Oscars. Um, the Nash equilibrium in the roommate's game is the choice by players to accept a, some kind of an inevitable uh, uh, principle, the tower of the T dishes. The Nash equilibrium in a, another version of the prisoner's dilemma called the fisheries game in which fishermen share a common lake or a sea. The Nash equilibrium in fact typically is overfishing which is likely to lead uh, to resource extinction. We are currently actually witnessing the disappearance of red tuna fish. Cod almost disappeared in the St. Lawrence River. Uh, and I can continue, the, th there are many examples. This, by the way, is also called the tragedy of the commons which another Nobel laureate called uh, Ronald Coase um, uh, uh, highlighted uh, in the 1960s. The Nash equilibrium in a sharing of a common atmosphere is another game that we all know very well. Uh, the Nash equilibrium is actually excess pollution. Every poor country advocates its right to the same industrial revolution as the rich, while rich countries have difficulties coming up with adequate compensation to induce the poor to turn to a green revolution. This leads to global warming. Why am I talking to you about dirty dishes, about fishes, about global warming in a conference on fiscal competition? Well, because fiscal competition can be viewed as another case of the, pre, the prisoner's dilemma with a potentially harsh Nash equilibrium, the race to the bottom. Let me take two countries, initially of same size, same wealth, same political philosophy, same fiscal policies. The two countries are in a state of tacit cooperation since they chose to adopt similar policies. Yet, at least one of them has an incentive to deviate from tacit cooperation and play hawk. By lowering its tax burden for companies, that country in the short run will attract new businesses, stimulate economic growth, stimulate employment, generate new revenues, and even possibly increase its total tax income, which may enable new redistributive policies and make that country's population better off. 
Hence, by deviating from tacit cooperation, this country becomes richer and stronger in the short run. Of course, the other, in the same time, becomes poorer and weaker. It is likely that it will respond by even stronger tax incentives for companies, leading eventually to a spiral of downward tax burdens for businesses, in other words, a race to the bottom, wiping out the short-run benefits of non-cooperation. This, however, in spite of its obvious suboptimality for both countries, is very much in Ash equilibrium. What is important for the future, and I come back to this idea of the future, what is important for the future is that in all the examples I've taken, this needs not be the only Nash equilibrium. In fact, there may be hope in the case of the two roommates, in the case of the fishermen, and even in the case of the environment. There exist strategies in, repeat, in repeated versions of the games that could lead to cooperative, more socially desirable outcomes. Cooperation, in fact, may require tit-for-tat type of strategies with potentially elements of, uh, of compensation. In other words, carrots and sticks strategies. Roommates, after a while, may come up with, the form, with some form of agreement and make the other's life miserable if he does not comply. Fishermen may unite, uh, establish quotas, and punish fishing abuse in some way or the other. Although this may become non-trivial if we deal with international waters. In the more difficult games, game of the climate, the sharing of a common atmosphere, uh, it is difficult, but we are slowly getting there. We, know, we all know this game. We experience it every day. We know how bad our current equilibrium is. So do most of our heads of states. Achieving cooperation to reduce CO2 emissions in partic is particularly difficult because there is uncertainty about the speed in which global warming will arise. Because some of our heads of states still don't believe there is any such thing as a global warming. Because there are strong incentives to push the problem to future generations. Cooperation requires communication between the players. It requires a good understanding of the consequences for all of the bad Nash equilibrium. It requires a good sense of how the other players will punish the one that withdraws from cooperation. It requires that punishment be in fact credible, otherwise Cooperation simply collapses and we revert to the bad equilibrium. Well, fiscal cooperation is no different. It also is very difficult to achieve. The benefits to each player from cooperation are unclear. The status quo over the years has in fact been fiscal competition. Assuming, assuming countries do settle for cooperation, Identifying a credible punishment for a country that does not comply is really not straightforward. Those who'd be, who would be very credible punishers, rich countries, have in fact practiced fiscal competition intensely. The problem is in fact as difficult to solve as that of the environment. However, Economic theory tells us that I have zero minutes left. Economic theory tells us that there is a better equilibrium uh, than the race to the bottom. It will not be easy to implement. It will require a change of culture. It calls for better communication among countries, negotiation in good faith, 
economic incentives for those who have the most to gain from fiscal competition and punishments for those who eventually defect from cooperation. The, the road to fiscal cooperation is indeed a long one, but it is probably worth trying. A conference, conference of parties a cup of taxes, like the one we know for the environment, and we are currently at COP21, would set the roadmap for a cooperative solution that would benefit all in the long run. My advice to our leaders is to formally establish this global forum. This is a very first step to enable countries to talk, eventually, by COP of Taxes 21, it may lead to a better cooperation. So why not give it a try?